Hello, everyone. Today, I'm joined by Aaron Cooper, who is the CEO of Groupon. Aaron, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. So I was doing a little bit of snooping on your LinkedIn profile um, before uh, <laughs> before the conversation. And I noticed that your, your first job, at least on LinkedIn, was working at PwC way, way back in the day. Yes. Uh, so I wanted to learn a little bit about your your first job. Actually, before we even get into that, why don't you tell people a little bit about Groupon in case they're not familiar with the company? So what do you guys do? How big is the company? Oh, excellent. Okay. So with Groupon, um, I'm hopeful that so many of the people listening um, are customers. Um, but Groupon is an amazing local marketplace. Um, our, our core business is all about experiences. That's things to do health, beauty, and wellness, food and drink, home and auto. It's about getting out and doing things. We have done billions of dollars of sales that we've sent through to small businesses all around the world. Um, I'll, I'll tell you some of the things among my favorites. Personally, I've done escape rooms. I went and shot archery. I've gone on um, scavenger hunts, um, things that are just super memorable. And then, of course, we do an absolute ton of beauty and wellness. Just in the third quarter of loan, um, we sold over $15 million worth of Botox. So oh our job God. is to really um, help consumers do a lot more and, and be a great source of inspirational demand for our merchants. And how many employees do you guys have? We have 4,000 employees. 4,000. Wow. Okay. So a huge company. Um, all right. So now that we have a little bit of context around uh, Groupon as a company, let's get to your what I think is your first job. That Was that at PwC? It was, and I'll just call it the technicality. It was a PW before the C. Ah, okay. So PW before the C. And so um, what was your first job like? What were you actually doing there? So this was super, um, I'm going to say glamorous, um, somewhat in jest, but, uh, or entirely in jest. But I was in the finance and economics group. Um, and our, our number one client was the United States Postal Service. And I'm just going to I'm just going to tell you a little bit more here because um, it'll get us great ratings on the show um, is that um, in finance and economics, part of what I did is I learned to write some code and do some statistical analysis and make sure that um, some of the big products that the Postal Service launches um, have the right cost structure and are otherwise like financially compliant. Um, among the things that um, I was tasked to do um, included going on data collection. And in one of my <clears throat> one of my big jobs then for a few weeks was to, to be in the back of a postal truck um, with a stopwatch in Tampa. And because it was early, you know, you called me on my first job. I had to wear a full suit. So it was still that era. So I think a picture 95 degrees in a postal truck in the in the middle of Tampa timing to for these new tracking and tracing products that the Postal Service was putting out. And we had to make sure that the, the cost structure was right based on how much time um was being spent in for the postal employees dealing with them. Um, but anyway, so is anything from frontline data collection um, all the way through writing code and presenting for your clients? More than you asked for in that question, but I gave That's it all. crazy. So you were wearing a full suit in the back of a truck in 95 degree heat. And it's, it's interesting because you said that was just what it was like, right? That was the, the culture. That was the environment that everyone was a part of. What, what year was that? That was 96. 96. Yeah. And it's, it's, interesting to see how different things are now like when you think about your career um and and a lot of the work that you've done do you see like visible changes in how the world of work has evolved or changed oh absolutely on on so many dimensions um i, I mean there's just there, there's so many dimensions to, to speak about there you have both the the truths of like sometimes there's just work to do and you got to do the work um but then just in the in the way folks are more and more connected and um, just how much progress, I think, has happened across industry and culture um, in, in that time um, is exciting. Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, and then I also saw that you worked at uh, AOL in the 90s. And some people might not remember AOL, but believe it or not, this was the, the, this was the main internet provider back in the day. I think it was AOL, what else? it was Netscape, where you used to like get the CDs that came with the with the computer. And I remember the AOL logo and those used to come in the CDs as well. Uh, so what was that like working at AOL in the 90s? Well, you, my job there was customer analysis. So it was my job. And in, in, now in the late 90s, as AOL was growing, 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 there wasn't a single month that could go by where it wasn't a higher customer number. 
So it was a great time to be in customer analysis, segmentation, analytics. Um, but the energy was unbelievable. Um, you can only imagine a company that was at that stage in its growth, winning, 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 um, the stock splitting multiple times over based on yeah. material and real success. Um, it was absolutely unbelievable energy. And, I, and I'll tell you, I've been super fortunate to have, have seen that more than one time um, in my career, because some people don't get to see that ever. Um, but a very exciting time at the AOL headquarter campus in, in Dulles, Virginia. Hmm. When you were younger, did you always know what you wanted to do? Like, did you, did you always know you wanted to get into business? Did you know that you wanted to be the CEO of a, of a large company? Or were you just kind of floating around and happened into this role? Um, so in, I'll, go, I'll go way back again uh, at Michigan, so I can throw out a little gold blue there. But at Michigan, um, I studied pre-med. I was, I was really interested in that career track. And I could say if I could, if I do it again, or maybe in, even like a second go, um, I like I like that field a lot. So no, I, this was not something um, that I had planned out step by step. Um, but um, you know, I've taken each step for what it's what it's been, and I've learned a lot along the way. So what was the path like? Uh, so you were pre med. How did you end up um, getting in the world of business? How did you end up becoming the CEO of Groupon? Okay, so I'm going to take you all the way through then because that's a it's a long timeline, but. Um, but I can tell a good story. Um, got great content. My job, um, or my, my first job in college was tutoring chemistry. I took organic chemistry, and for whatever reason, I got A pluses. I don't know why nothing's ever come that easy to me, but it just came easy. And I started a tutoring business for organic chemistry. And it turned out that I could make good money in college tutoring organic chemistry. And then I took a, an economics class, and they put the supply and demand curves up on the board. They said, you know, if you can raise the price without reducing your demand, that's a good thing. So yeah. the next people that called, the price went up um, and there was something to this. So in any case, I really did um, like the business elements and I switched in the, in the back half of undergrad to economics. At Pricewaterhouse and then at AOL, which I told you about, I wrote code. I really did like that work. And I think it's great work to have done at any stage in your career for anybody. Um, my kids are writing code right now, so you get it even earlier. Um, and then I, I did some turnaround management work, more great work to have done. So um, not only did I get a chance to write code, but I got a chance to see distressed companies, companies that are run by the, the cash flow and the balance sheet and are solving very different problems than growth oriented companies. I moved from there to orbits into a finance capacity. And I was in orbits in a finance capacity in an important year and a lucky time for me, but 2004 at that period. Um, you know, people were just figuring out e-commerce, just figuring out online marketing. And I had just come from distressed companies. And so I was looking at the way we were spending our money. And I went to my boss, the VP of finance and suggested, Hey, here's a better approach from a, a financial measurement standpoint. And he liked it. And, um, you know, nine months later, I got promoted to lead our online marketing, um, which is something that totally made sense in 2004 to bring somebody out of finance and put them in charge of what was a $150 million marketing budget. Um, you know, there might be like other stages in that career track right now, but in 2004, that made a lot of sense. Um, and I appreciate um, the people that made that decision in such a big way, because for me, it was one of the two big pivots of my career. And, and from there, I had a, a, a seven, eight year run in marketing, um, growth marketing at Orbitz, um, just after its IPO um, in um, the finance industry at Options Express. And then I was Groupon's first CMO in our, our biggest growth year. At the end of that year, um, Andrew Mason, our founding CEO, uh, CEO and, and Rob Solomon, our COO, um, grabbed me and they said, we want you to go start new businesses for us. And hmm. um, that was my chance to say yes. So that was my second really big career pivot was going from marketing into general management roles. And that's where then I have had a chance over um, the rest of my tenure at Groupon to lead each of our different business units into the details, building the teams, building the business logic um, until moving into this role as uh, our interim CEO. How important was leading from uh, different businesses or different geographies towards shaping you as a leader? In other words, like if you would have just stayed in marketing, marketing for your entire life, do you think you'd be the type of leader that you are now? Or was seeing the different aspects of the business really crucial for you? For me, 
every th single thing I told you right now was important. Working at distressed companies, that's perspective. How do the debt holders think? Mm -hmm. What does it mean when you have to make a decision like I might not make payroll? Well, now you have a real priority. It's yeah. not like a growth company making their priorities. Um, the way that you learn marketing is important. In that timeline, not only did I le learn online marketing, but I spent a couple of years look, working for a brilliant brand marketer who taught me really good strategic brand marketing. And I've gotten to apply, and I still do, and my team knows it, um, structure from each of these different bosses that I've had throughout all of, the, the, all of my years um, to the problems we are solving now at Groupon. So I think um, incredibly important. Um, and not only have I had a chance to work in finance, marketing, brand marketing, and general management, but I've done it across online travel, online finance, retail, portal work at, uh, at AOL, and some distressed companies as well. So I've been really fortunate in uh, just the breadth and, and depth, both of them, that I've seen in my career. And, and all of that shapes my perspective. Well, it seems like that goes against like the, the traditional idea of leadership, because I think what most people are taught is basically like you pick a field, whether it's HR or sales. And you kind of stay in that one area. And basically what you do is you go from like a sales associate to director, like you climb that one area. Uh, would you say that it's a fair piece of advice to encourage leaders to not do that <laughs> and to get different experiences? I, I give that advice all the time. And now I'll give you a recipe. Now this recipe's worked for me. It, it yeah. may not work for everybody. Um, I think there's something special about um, big, but not too big companies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have these companies that are in these, you know, less than 10 million, greater than a billion range. And I've, I've yeah. worked at, at, at a number of these, um, at least three. Uh, and, and in these situations, you end up with something that's big enough that you can have different roles in so many different functions and small enough that you can have a reputation that's felt all around the company. Yeah. That allows people to grab you and say, I need this person over here. I don't care if they have the skill set. This is the help that I need and allow you to learn something new and contribute in a bigger and different way. And for, for my employees here, um, that's something that I also look to almost force those opportunities. For in each of my different big career moves, um, I didn't even know the jobs were available that I was being asked to move into. And mm -hmm. somebody just grabbed me and said, move. It wasn't like I was positioning myself for that. If someone yeah. grabbed me and said, you're moving. Um, and, and I learned pretty quickly after the first couple of times, hemming and hawing, do I want that? Do I not want that? Just say yes. If the senior person in the organization has your back and they said, I need your help, you say yes, even if it makes you uncomfortable, and then you'll learn and grow. And um, that's my best advice because um, for me, it's worked very well. And I probably have three or four examples throughout my career where, where that play has, has worked out. I've interviewed a, a couple of CEOs, even right before we jumped on the call, I interviewed uh, Kathy Mazzarella. She's the CEO of Graybar, and I think they have like 9,000 employees. And she was telling me that one of the things that helped her grow the most was saying yes to things that other people didn't want to say yes to, like the hard things, the challenging things, the things that made her scared and uncomfortable, uh, which I think is great advice because a lot of people tend to shy away from that stuff. Um, but earlier, you made a point that you you worked for a lot of bosses, and even today at Groupon, you share a lot of what you learned from those bosses uh, in, inside of Groupon. Have you ever worked for a really bad boss? Uh, and do you have any stories of um, working for a really bad boss versus working for a really great boss, and, and like what that difference was, what made them great, what made that person not so great? Um, I've worked for tough bosses. Um, and you know, I'd say bordering on, on too tough. You may not want to repeat that relationship, no doubt. Yeah. Um, but listen, when, when I, when I look at those times and at those times I was focused on what I can learn out of this situation. Um, it's, it's a mind shift. You have to decide that, that you want to be in that situation and you're, you're up for learning from this person. Um, I also find that when you adopt that mindset, the, the tougher boss changes their attitude towards you. Um, mm -hmm which is something that I realized as well, hey, I'm a student, so please teach, um, is, is, um, was, has been a productive relationship for me there to get the most out of those. And because there's our tools that I have in my toolkit now. Now, from a, an amazing boss standpoint, it's, a, it's been a different vibe. And I would, I would point it out this way. Um, I had a boss that with very little effort could get me to just run through walls, work, you know, work, think, 
really just think around corners on every problem and just wanting to be the best to show up for him. And um, the way he made me feel was as just, I made me feel like I, I was, I was the path. He needed me. He needed my help. He was counting on me and he knew I could do it. And for that, I just wanted to show up with that reputation that, yeah. you know, he presented for me and he just did it in such a smooth way um, that I, you know, was um, for me connected to me very well and um, got the best out of me. What did he do or she do that um, allowed that to happen? Um, it was so I'll, I'll give you an example of um, I'll start with like just one of my my uh, my first relatively big business mistakes. But when I moved into this role, um, leading um, our online marketing, um, we did a deal, and the deal was just a bad deal. Um, and he and it was a bad deal for a fair amount of zeros attached to it. And he, he called me out, and it was the most amazing dynamics. I can still reflect on it. He called me out, made it clear, and then told me it was mine to solve, and he was counting on me to solve it, and just did it in a way that. I internalized it with such positive energy to motivate my team to get after it and, and correct what we could correct. Um, but I look on it in such a favorable experience, whereas that same exact dynamic, um, you know, could have been handled like, you know, 90% more negative yeah. ways by other people. So it sounds like you could be a tough boss, but still a good boss. And there's a difference between being tough versus just being a jerk. Uh, and I feel like sometimes today, a lot of employees have a hard time separating that. Um, you know, they think that if like you're tough, you're pushing them, you're asking for more. It's like, ah, oh, Aaron is such a jerk. He wants me to, like, he keeps pushing me. But there's a difference there, right? Between being a tough boss versus just being a, a jerk. And, and is there a fine line there? I mean, there's absolutely a fine line. I think, um, you know, I mean, the, the 100% there's a fine line. And I, I guess it probably comes down to how you leave people feeling. Yeah. You leave people feeling when you leave the room. Is it like, the one boss I described, the team is motivated beyond belief to just to, to crush it for you. Or do you leave it where, you know, they want out? I mean, there's just two ways to handle all these situations. And when you think about like the value you're getting, um, you know, selfishly out of your employees, you, you so want the one. Um, and so, yeah, I absolutely think that there's a, there's a fine line, a very important line. What does a typical day look like for you? Um, so uh, um, I like to work out in the morning. I got a combination. I um, I little I either in, uh, Peloton, big into Peloton. Um, I do a little PRX on rotation, and this year it's yoga. Um, and so those are my my that's my rotation. Um, you know, I'll, I'll take my kids to school a couple days a week, and and then I get right after it with the team. I have uh, breakfast with uh, some of my direct reports. Um, every few weeks. So everyone's on a rotation there. And for that meeting, um, we really just focus on them and their career. It allows me to have a real connection with folks like before we get into the, the mess of the day. And so there's mm -hmm. um, some time set aside for that. And then um, and then throughout the day, I try to really build in enough downtime so I can I can think. Um, and and that's important to me as well. Some downtime for that and um, try to make sure that I'm home and present with my family um, so I can play some games with the kids before putting them in bed. That's the well, full. Yeah, and I, I, so I wanted to build on this concept of downtime a little bit because uh, it, it feels like now it's becoming harder and harder to get downtime, especially with, I mean, as a leader, right? I mean, you have technology, you're always connected. Everybody wants things from you. Your iPhone is, or your whatever phone is, is, is buzzing. People are pinging you. Um, how do you carve out that time for downtime? And, and how many, are we talking like 30 minutes, an hour? Because uh, I would imagine you actually have to say no to a lot of people and a lot of things to be able to get that downtime. So how do you actually say no? So one, you, you just have to say no. So at, at any, you know, the at least for me, you ride the wave, you're, you feel pretty on top of things. And then like, hey, a lot of stuff creeps on. You have to push more of it off and you have to have rigorous prioritization um, of your own time to make sure you carve out this time for not just reflection for yourself throughout the whole week, um, but downtime so you can be really present for your team and for everybody who's counting on you. Um, so I do it in a very deliberate way. Um, and and then it, and I take advantage of that time, whether it's, you know, um, 
go for a little bit of walk in, in you know, work from home COVID environment, which I encourage everyone to do, um, to just kind of reflecting on like, you know, the, the right priorities in any big problems. But it's got to be deliberate or you will not get it done. Something else will creep in. And then from a personal standpoint, um, you know, the phone has to go away so I can focus on my kids. That's a tricky transition for yep. anybody. Um, it's tricky for me. But I'll, I'll tell you the best advice I got this year, and I'm doing my best at it. Um, it's from the, the smartest person I know. And I'm glad this is recorded, but uh, um, and the love of my life, uh, my wife. But she, she turned me on to, she had me read a book, 24-6. Uh, and it's all about just like really um, on Saturday, um, doing more off screens and very present. Um, and, and so that's something that, am I doing it perfectly? No. But if you plan your week around that, um, it can really change, like it changes the way you feel completely. At least it has for me. And so that's been something that I've done as part of like the kind of like broader arc of the week as well. That's been grounding. So when you talk about downtime, how much downtime do you think you need a day or do you recommend people get a day just to, just to think and brainstorm stuff? I mean, if you if you're amazing at it, I you know you're probably you know of the whatever you want to call it, like you know nine hours that you know you know give or take that people are focused on on work. You know, you want three something oh, wow. material three. It's it's got to be because if you don't, I mean, was that was that a while like that's that's while like maybe you thought that was a lot or or not the much. Yeah, no, no, I thought you were gonna say like, oh yeah, I just need like thirty minutes or fifteen minutes just to like clear my head. Like three hours, yeah, that's there's. I mean, there's real if you if you actually get a chance to think. Get a chance to think there's such important things that you can always solve for your team. And sometimes during that time, I may, could I call somebody and think a problem through with them? Absolutely. But it's time for me to just make sure to take a step back and make sure that in the, the relative challenges of COVID and people working from home and all everything that comes with that for running a company where um, local businesses around the world have been shut down and their business has been impaired and we're looking for our strategies that we're working on right now to be successful to help our broad community of Groupon exit there's so much in there for for me just to make sure that as things change day to day um everyone's coming along the same way yeah do, do you have a process for thinking and i know it sounds like a weird question but um like how do you make sure that you're not just sitting not doing anything right because because i mean you could sit there like hanging out i mean yeah. three hours you could watch a movie uh two and movies even it's so so yeah a couple of things one it's it's certainly um a very active downtime okay um so uh, i want to make sure we I, I talk about it the right way there but i'm 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 um i'm incredibly structured um i'm even to the you know i, I love to structure time to be creative but like in the way that i'll plan stuff you know it'll, it'll be structured so within that downtime um, I will always have a list of things that are just really important for me to work through um, either, again, by myself and thinking things through or with certain team members that I'll need to just pull in um, as as things come up. But important or, you know, but important things come up and it's yeah. just important to have that time set aside um, so that you can be active um, and engage on it. But for me, it's, it's nothing more than making sure that the, the time is there because there's always very important things to fill up that time as, as long as you keep your priorities straight. So what would be an example of something that you would use that downtime for? Um, would there be like a, a problem? So like, should Groupon enter a new market uh, or something like that? And so you really think through that, like, do you diagram things out? You just kind of like, how do you, how do you approach a problem or something like that when you need to think about it? So one, it's just important, I think, in any leadership to know what the priorities are. For us at Groupon, we're, um, we've done a really good job throughout the entire company and my entire team has rallied around our core priorities. Um, we are, we're just, we've, we've done a, and I just wanna thank the team for all of their work, um, you know, over the, the course of this pandemic. But um, we, we have had a significant restructuring. We're taking almost a, a quarter of a billion in cost out of the business. And for a lot of people, that means taking on more and focusing um, and prioritizing. Um, and, and then as we've moved through that, um, we've restructured the way that we're thinking about work to get more productivity. We are 
building more demand within COVID in a way that's safe for our customers, in a way that merchants um, are, ex you know, it's important for them to be able to get. And all throughout this period of time, we've been focused on changing this business so that when customers and merchants um, are fully ready to come back, they're coming back to a new Groupon, which is a strategy yeah. that we've been um, heads down, but obsessively focused on and, and just excited to share information. Um, you know, as as we're we're hitting new and important milestones, but this is this is our focus, and within that, there's just important things that come up that you constantly need to be able to unblock and change, and and you need to have time set aside because we're moving very quickly as a team, um, and so that's a lot of what will um, will take our focus, and so I'll give you a, just a, a couple of examples, um, but back in August. Um, as we were reinventing the way that we wanted to take our business to market with our merchants, um, we, you know, we're having some challenges um, with getting this exact um, sales pitch to work. And so we pulled a bunch of people together and thought of just a new way to do it. But it was a result of having this downtime. No formal meetings or sessions were available for that because we just learned it a few days earlier and then we had to get into it and then we had to be able to move on it. Um, and that may not be the best example, but it was definitely a way that, we're, that we were um, adapting to something that was one of our top focus areas. But I'll tell you what's not going to creep into that downtime. Priority number seven or eight. It is okay. just going to be something else that helps us move a little faster or better together on those top few priorities um, for your team, for your organization. Okay, perfect. Um, so we got a couple of questions that came in on LinkedIn that I wanted to ask. Uh, one from Nadia. She says, What's the best way to encourage your wider team to make decisions without constant escalation for you to approve? So it sounds like the question is around how do you give those that you work with autonomy to make decisions and run with things so that not everybody comes to you and says, hey, Aaron, what should we do? You know, can you approve this? Should we do this? Uh, how do you give people control? So there's a couple of things that, that we've done very deliberately. One is transparency. This list of priorities that I would that I would talk to you about, we have an internal scorecard. Everybody knows what they are. When we launched our new strategy, we didn't just explain the strategy. We went team by team, person by person to make sure they internalized it. Hmm. Like, because that's how you get real leverage. Yeah. And someone in accounting is going to internalize the strategy differently than someone in sales and engineering and customer service. Like all throughout, it means something different. I've worked in a lot of these different teams. And so like, I've just seen it. And, and I know how it speaks to me. So we want to make sure. Does it matter if they're like, you know, they've been at the company for three months or they've been at the company for 10 years? Everybody, everybody gets it. Um, so it's interesting. People that have been here for 10 years come with a little bit more baggage in their perspective than people that have been here for three months. This is just what we're doing. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, you have a very different place that everyone's at. But to get to get the energy moving in the right direction, people need to understand the strategy and not just understand. We pause there believe. And there's, that is different. Understanding as I explained it to you, you might walk out the door and I don't believe in what those guys told me at all. So we need to get to believe, but believe can't be mandated. Believe have to have a back and forth. And so we took this thing to the next level to make sure people believed. And, um, and we took risks with that. I mean, I, I was up in front of the entire company more than once. We took live surveys how many people understand, how many people believe and just publish the results and said what we we're going to do next. Um, because that is what's so important is the transparency and the alignment within that empowerment, giving someone the task, the resources um, and trusting them in their judgment becomes so much easier because yeah. trying to goal something so specifically for the uncertainties um, going on right now is, is that much harder. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really proud of our team across the board for the way that everyone has come along on this. And I think people were skeptical at the beginning, because, but as they saw the way that very challenging questions that stood between an individual understanding and that person believing were addressed publicly, more and more people came with those questions. And we've been able just to move the entire organization along, which is a huge thing for not only employee satisfaction, but getting the most out of the team. So I'm, I'm really proud mm -hmm. of the team across the board and, and all leaders who helped in that. What advice do you have for people who are listening to this, who are leaders who are trying to get their teams to believe? In other words, they, they focus on getting people to understand. It's like, I get it, but they're having a hard time getting their employees to believe, like to, to really get behind something. 
Uh, any strategies or advice for what leaders can do to help kind of bridge that gap? Um, one, you just have to stay committed to it. So we do um, we do anonymous surveys, um, and but just, but we'll also encourage um, at a certain level in the organization. It just shouldn't be anonymous. Your job is to just challenge. That, that's part of like what the job is. But also, I think it makes it easier for people when they hear a question to be able to pile on and say, that's my question, too. Maybe it's phrased a little bit differently. Um, but you have to be disciplined because there's so many different stages where you just might want to be done and move on to execution. Yeah. And and you may have felt like, oh, they heard me now. How can everyone not be on the same page? Everyone's got stickers on their computer and a T-shirt that says the strategy on it. That's not it. If they can explain it back to you. And if they explain it back to you with maybe like, I don't know, the excitement with which I'm answering your question, then you know they got it. But if they don't got it, they don't got it. And you have more work to do before you get the best out of everybody. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a, it's a tough gap to close between understanding and believing. Um, we also got another question came in from Elizabeth. She says, what are the things that you're prioritizing for 2021 regarding like uh, uh, learning, development, leadership, uh, just people, people skills and things you want your people to know for, for 2021. What are you focusing on? So um, across the board, um, we're always looking for um, key leadership development opportunities um, for everybody. And the reason, reason for that is, um, one, if you do right by your employees, like the employees are leaning in more to their careers. So I encourage um, everybody to know the things that they want to learn. Um, and, and then our job is, you know, set people up for those opportunities as much as possible. That's like, it's a very, um, but that has always worked the best for me in working with my employees to help them develop and help them grow. And that may be person by person, um, in the way that actually shows up now across the organization, um, we're really, um, energized around re improving our performance culture. So mm -hmm. let's talk about what that means. That means, um, embracing product discovery in a way that, that we haven't yet done here before. We're on the phone more with merchants. We're on the phone more with customers. We're watching their interactions at a finer level of detail than we ever have before. And we're funneling those insights back to our product teams to fundamentally change. When I told you about the problem that we had in August or, or September, when we were focused on trying to get our pitch to work, I kind of didn't tell you how it ended. It ended with us um, accelerating our inventory um, growth, which was our goal, by over 50%. So from a new product launch, when you get like a 1% improvement, you feel good. When you get 50%, you know you're onto something. As a direct result from this type of frontline product discovery work and doing the hard work. And so we're really leaning in hard overall on performance culture and what that means and how that shows up. But it's definitely backing up from what are the results what are the things we need to change in this particular example I'm giving you is our value proposition to our customers and our merchant. And then just getting after the real problem so that we can move things all the way through. Hmm. Uh, do you have any regular um, rituals or practices or, or techniques or things that you do that you think make you a better leader or, or just shape your day in a more positive way? Anything that you do on a constant basis? So, among them, and I, I, I may I'll go back to something that I mentioned, but I think having um, that time for reflection is important um, because then I can reflect on times throughout the day or the week before. Maybe I wasn't the leader that I wanted to be, and I could yeah. I could focus on that going forward. But the but one thing that um one thing that I've learned, and I I didn't know this until it was just told to me, is the importance of um, authenticity in your leadership style. And, and just to give you a sense as to how I learn, um, I, I went to this week long HBS class on authentic leadership. So like I needed to have it like really jammed in my face. Um, there wasn't just a playbook for leadership. You had to be the leader that you were. And, and once I read that, I was like, oh, that makes sense. And yeah. so I went through this whole program throughout the week um, about how you figure out more the type of leader that you are so that you can take advantage of the leader you are and not the leader that you read about from somebody else. Um, and so for me, um, that's been also very important. So, um, a lot of the things I'm telling you about, um, that work for me are grounded in, in doing that yeah. thinking. Um, and that's something that I would also, um, recommend to everybody. So what kind of leader would you say you are? Um, 
I'm an energetic leader. Um, I'm a structured thinking leader. Um, I like to make sure that we have the strategy and goals set out clearly and people have embraced those. Um, because what it, for me, it's grounded in getting the absolute best out of, out of the team um, and, and having them show up um, in ways where the energy that, that they're both getting and giving to Groupon makes them feel better about themselves outside of Groupon, especially um, in a pandemic. Um, and I think that takes on a couple different forms. And I'll just give you a couple, of, uh, I'll give you, an, I mean, one more example. But um, among the things that we've done here is not just the strategy to get people to understand and believe, which again, that speaks to the type of leader that, that I am and what's been important to me because it's always been important to me in my career is to believe in ways that made sense to me so I could do more. And I'm looking for that out of, out of our team. Um, I found that that really was important for the organization. Another thing that um, I didn't know what type of leader I was until the, um, call it like the, 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 time, the time hit, but um, after the killing of George Floyd, there was a question as to how do people show up as leaders? And what are you going to do during that period of time? And I had been interim CEO for two months. Um, and I'm, I'm proud of the support I got from my team so that um, we as a company could come together and have and talk about things and, um, and then learn more how to talk about things. We did a company-wide book club on white fragility. Um, we had hundreds of people involved. And it was such an important moment for me as a leader that I, I didn't know about myself until that had happened, where I got to find the leverage that you can get out of being a leader in this type of situation. We, we had numerous sessions of the book club and, um, and a, in the second, second session, um, we had different employees come out to say, how has what they learned in the book, White Fragility, how has that impacted the way they're thinking and acting? Um, and we had teammates from around the world coming up with and explaining the examples of how um, what they learned about themselves and how to be an anti-racist um, showed up in their personal lives and in their communities with the real examples of people um, taking action. And so if we had hundreds of people reading the book, taking action, influencing hundreds more, it was very easy to see the, the leverage that we were getting um, and in a positive way. And so that was one of many things that we did. But again, the, I think the key for me at the time, and it's only looking back, was there was a question as to like, what action do you take? Do you take no action? Um, and I think the real lesson in that is you take action. Um, yeah. and, and you don't worry about, um, you know, getting it a little wrong here or there. And then I think that shows that that's important in a number of ways. So you mentioned the pandemic, which is something I wanted to ask you about as well. Uh, how did, or well, did, how has COVID um, impacted both the business and also just how you approach a leadership? Has it, has it changed the way that you're leading the company at all? Absolutely. I think the company is in many ways, I mean, we're, we're a different company right now. I mean, end to end. Um, and, and I'm really proud of, of the teams who's, you know, helped lead us through all of the different elements of that transition, but to, to set the stage in April, um, our, our core local business, all of these local experiences around the world, um, the business was down in the 80% range. Wow. So that's, that's not 10%, that's 80%. Yeah. Um, we had to act very quickly to, um, manage our balance sheet and manage the teams. We very quickly put in place almost a quarter billion dollar um, restructuring, which we're executing on methodically. Um, we then worked with our merchants and our customers and started to see the business come back. Um, and we're able to encourage um, behavior um, to help grow local um, as people got more comfortable into the summer. Over this period of time, we also developed um, our, port our approach to performance culture and our approach to reinventing the strategy. And so hmm. um, these components are all things that have now made the company um, a different operating culture internally, one that's, you know, through, you know, common understanding of our strategy and just 
a leaner structure um, and a more delayered structure, which gave more people an opportunity to step up, mm -hmm. um, more empowerment. Um, but when you're when you're leading a local business um, in the middle of um, COVID, um, and and you have all the other dynamics of work from home, um, there's no doubt that you know you're going to be a different company, um, not just in your in your broad external community, your your customers and merchants, but in your your core um, employee community as well. And so, what about your approach to leadership? Uh, how has it changed the way that you lead? Uh, I mean, I would imagine you know it's also different in the fact that you have to lead from behind a screen now, right? You probably weren't doing as many of those all hands meetings, couldn't stop by somebody's desk and say hi. Have you had to change your approach to leadership at all? So from day one, and I'm happy, I mean, this gets back to, this has been an amazing time to be a leader because either you're taking action and it didn't work this week, but it, you know, it works next week. And if you're not taking action, you're just not gonna, you're not gonna be able to change. And, and so I think we've, we've seen so much progress from our leadership team by taking action. And so one of the first actions we took, as we said, every week at the minimum, I'm going to be out in front of the employee base and, and even maybe multiple times a week, depending on different groups, way back in, in the spring when things were incredibly new and intense. Um, but it is so important just to be out in front, to be out in front with um, transparency on communication. And we would let people score us on transparency, even if it was being transparent, they feel we we're being transparent and responsive um, to the back and forth dynamic of employees. And so um, I don't think there's anything that you could do um, from a communication standpoint, if it's authentic, um, you, couldn't, you can never do enough. Um, and, and certainly over this period of time of Zoom um, and um, virtual working, um, you know, that you can take that to an extreme. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so we had a couple more questions come in. One is around, um, would you say that different leadership styles align with specific functional roles? Um, and I know it's kind of a broad question, but would you say there's a certain leadership style that's better for a CMO or a CFO or a, a CEO? Um, there's probably stereotypical styles, but I don't think there's a better style. You just mentioned, okay. have you mentioned what marketing, finance, and, and CEO roles. And of course, I've been a CMO. Before that, I was I was on the path to be CFO, and now I'm a CEO. So um, I don't necessarily think so. Okay. I think that you can you need a team that complements each other. Um, and I think that that's, that's going to be important at, at all levels of the organization. Okay. And another question came in is around, what is your best tip on leading global, a globally spread team to follow the same purpose, even uh, more so now that many people are working remotely? Which is a great question, right? Because you have like this this one purpose, you know, you want everybody to believe um, in, in what Groupon is doing, but you have different cultures, backgrounds, people are thousands of miles away from each other. So how do you get alignment on that? One thing that's interesting here is that the advice that I got <clears throat> when I first stepped into a global general management role was, um, and this was before video was more common, always be on video, always have the video on. And, and then always show up and always be present and overemphasize that with the folks that um, are outside the country. And like I said, I, I've got a lot of good mentors over the years and I take advice seriously and that seemed like good advice and I put it to work directly and, and people showed up and I was able to build relationships, um, which again, when you get past, when you get to that level of trust, um, you know, a five minute phone call. You can communicate a lot of the five minute phone call if you have a decent relationship to people around the world. Yeah. And then, of course, those relationships permeate the rest of the office. Um, and so I think that being present, um, this is in interesting in the sense that, like, um, things are more equal now. My employees of Chicago, I see them, you know, on Zoom just as much as I see our employees uh, in Europe and, and in India. So um, for, for me to be out in front and be present, um, it's important for everybody, but it's important at every single level. Um, and then the way that um, you check on each office has got to be different. You have to check with the local leader um, because maybe you didn't read the body language correctly um, in, you know, on yep. Zoom, or maybe you're not sure if they heard you the right way. Um, and so it's just about you know the same thing we talked about earlier, which is going that extra step to make sure that the message was, was received and internalized and in, in to those that population and in the right way. Uh, what do you personally look for 
in a leader. So if you're thinking of promoting somebody instead of Groupon, whether it's an entry-level employee to a mid-level leadership position or somebody going from mid-level leader to senior executive role, uh, what are some of the, the qualities or characteristics that you look for that you think up make a that you think make up a great leader? Um, hiring and bringing in great talent, having a great followership um, mm -hmm. of people that have worked for the leader before and want to work for them again, someone who's thinking around corners. Um, those are all things that I think are important to like the the qualities as to the way that. Um, people show up. I think that um, that the leaders get leverage out of their teams, and so I'm just I'm giving you a recipe as to things that have worked for me, and this kind of along the lines of what we've talked about. Yeah. Um, but um, the way that the leaders leave people feeling so that they get the best out of them is going to be what's absolute most important. I absolutely love the functional expertise. I love self-awareness. Um, and I, I love people coming with the, the energy. Um, but people get all those different results in different ways. Um, and there is no one recipe there. What if you had somebody who is a really, really high performer, like they were amazing at their job? Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe they're the best coder you've ever seen or the best salesperson. Uh, but they're also a bit of a jerk and they're not really good at working with other people. Would you promote somebody like that? Or, or what do you, how do you handle somebody like that who is a fantastic contributor, individual performer, but they're just not, um, you know, they're just kind of a jerk? So there's, there's, I guess there's two types of jerks, right? There's jerks that are not self-aware and there's jerks that are self-aware and just don't care that they're jerks. You got to <laughs> find out who you're dealing with. Um, and so I find, listen, I find that coaching and awareness can go pretty far with a lot of folks. Um, but there's no excuse for that type of behavior because then you're, it's counter to what we just talked about. The way that, yeah. that person's leaving people feeling is now destructive. Um, and you only have to see that so many times and live through it before you realize, oh my God, I should have done something sooner. I think coaching can be really effective. I think direct conversations could be effective. Um, I think um, putting the person in a role where their qualities can be put to the best use um, and the damage can be minimized or eliminated can also be effective. But I'm just giving you different ways to say, like, this has got to be dealt with head yeah. on um, and can't be swept under the rug because that's toxic to the whole organization. Yep. Uh, what advice would you give your younger self? So if you could go back in time to... Uh... Uh, Aaron, who's working at PW back in, I think you said 1996, what advice would you give yourself? Man, it's a good one. I guess just don't stress out as much. It's all going to work out. Stay focused on the important things in life. All the stuff that, you know, you want to give, you wish you knew, at least for me, I wish I knew back then. Um, and um, just got to roll with things. Yeah, no, that's great advice. I like that. Um, what do you as a leader do to keep up with what's going on? Because obviously there's a lot of changes going on in the world. Uh, you know, this is everyone's, well, for most people's first pandemic. Uh, there's just a lot of change happening. What do you do to make sure that you are staying on top of everything? I mean, technology, what's going on in the world, what your employees care about. There's just so much to keep up with. How do you not get overwhelmed? You got to, I guess, just like everybody else, listen for the right things. But I'm at my best when it's my teams that are pushing me. And that usually means pushing information perspective that I hadn't thought of or heard before. I you know, deeply respect the, the folks that work for me here. And so that's one source of new information and insight that I'm um, constantly paying attention to. Um, I, I mentioned the the book that my my wife suggested, but I'm probably in like, you know, three or four different book clubs right now. Um, but, but it's all, you know, it's my mom, it's my kids, it's my friends, you yeah. know, people at work. But like, it's just, there's different things there. Um, so I really like, uh, I like reading. I, of course, listen to your podcast. Uh, and oh, uh, any shameless self plugs that I get, the bonus hey, points. You asked, you asked. I just got to. <laughs> <laughs> tell you what I do. Um, and but there, there's there's a lot of different sources. It's got to be high leverage. But just to the point I said, said earlier, it's got to it's got to be supportive of your leadership style and what you want to learn there. Um, I think that that's important um, and that that can change over the time and over experience. And then and then functionally, I think there's a lot of ways to pick up you know functions and technology and, and strategy and tactics. 
what do you do if you have a certain leadership style that uh, those around you don't support? So for example, you're really big, I know, on uh, being authentic. You have this two-way dialogue and communication and collaboration. Uh, let's say you weren't the CEO of Groupon. You were maybe an entry level or a maybe mid-level employee at the company and nobody around you supported that dialogue. Or everyone was really big on just hierarchy, command and control. Don't be honest and transparent with people, but you believe that you should be. How do you deal with that situation where um, what you believe a, a great leader should be like contradicts with the the culture that you're a part of or what everybody else around you is doing? Or have you ever had that happen? Actually, it's a it's a good it's a good question. I think I've I've definitely had it at times in my career. I can't say I've been part of a whole organization for long where like I just didn't fit with the the entire culture didn't feel right to me. Yeah, um, but there's definitely been times in teams where um, things have felt better than other times. And I think, again, for those times, um, you have, I, I love learning and I love growth. It's a core value of mine. It's something, and even outside of work, it's something that I enjoy. Um, and and so the way I, I've always approached that is um, you have to make a list of the things that you can learn. And, and those may be leadership qualities um, and the impact that you could have. And at some point, you either can think your way around some of the what feels like blockers, or you can't. And if you can't, maybe it's a time to move. If you can, um, I've found many times that a situation felt like it couldn't work out, where when I actually thought it through, I just needed a different path. And um, there was no reason just to like, you know, throw the whole thing away in favor of um, some changes that I could make from my own perspective. Hmm. So I, you know, I think I take a balanced approach to the whole thing. Um, that's probably advice built on some mistakes I've made along the way. So hopefully helpful to folks. Yeah. Uh, another question we came in, uh, or another question um, that was recently asked is, what percent of your time is used for mentoring others, uh, whether internal to Groupon or external? And is there something that you learned from a mentee in a reverse mentoring relationship that you will never forget? Um, yes and yes. Um, so one, the answer is probably not enough. Um, time is spent that way. It's definitely something I, I wish I could do more of. I always, I've been fortunate enough to been in a lot of different roles and functions, as I mentioned. And so um, I've walked in the shoes of a lot of different people that I have a chance to mentor. And I find like that's really good when you're then looking out for their best interest super genuinely yeah. as to like, what skills do you want to build? I've had people who lead sales who tell me they want to be a general management. And I was like, could write down what that means to you. I was like, sounds to me like you want to be a really good sales leader. That's different. But, you know, you can, you can work through some of these things together to help people understand where they want to go. And, and I always feel like that service to employees um, pays back so many different ways and also just feels great to do. Um, so I would say absolute, you know, not enough there. And what was your second question? The second question she asked is, um, what have you learned from that kind of a mentee-mentor relationship? Oh. Is it, or is there something that you've learned that you will never forget? Um, yeah, so we we have a program here at Groupon um, that pairs, um, it starts by prioritizing um, diverse employees with mentors um, in the organization um, where you spend a fair amount of time together. Um, and so I think the biggest thing is I was all, you know, I embarrassed myself on your show. Um, so I always wanted to get right into the, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? What are all these different, you know, tell me where you want to go. And I was ready for that conversation because most people when they're, when they had the time with me, that's what they wanted to talk about. And, and he, uh, he skipped all that and wanted to just have a human conversation, a legitimate get to know. We come from different backgrounds. Let's get to know each other. Hmm. And because in, in reflection, I, I hadn't I hadn't walked in his shoes in his life in so many different ways. And I didn't have the perspective. And I think, honestly, a lot of the advice I give him without taking those steps would have fallen flat. Um, and now I have that perspective. And so I thank him for it. Um, but there's I mean, it, that definitely is something that stuck with me, um, not just in mentor mentee relationships, but it's in life in general. And as as you you know, if people decide how they um change their leadership style going forward. For me, um, that's been something that was material. If there is something that listeners should stop doing to become a better leader, what do you think they should stop doing? And just a heads up, I'm also going to ask you if there's something that you think listeners should start doing to become a better leader. 
Okay. Um, so stop doing, um, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to go with maybe an easy one, but I'm also going to, you know, put my money where my mouth is on this one is like, you got to stop, um, stop playing it safe right now. Now, of course, we're in a unique situation. Stop playing it safe with our, with our core business down in the way yeah. that it was, there was no choice, but, but through, um, and so what that means is, um, for us, um, it meant reinventing this entire business. It meant spending the time and the cycles to make sure that we knew how we were going to have a strategy for growth within this organization. And we were going to push through all of the different hard things and make all of the hard decisions. Mm -hmm. One of the things I learned in my turnaround management days is you just got to make the hard decisions because you know what? Time does not help when you're running mm -hmm. out of cash. Now, we weren't in that situation here, but like I learned that earlier in my career. And that's something that now in, in leading through a year like now, um, it shows up and it shows up in important ways. So stop playing it safe is, I think, really, really big. And then should I, should I you know, follow up on that? Should I want to tell you what people should start doing? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, of course. Um, I think it's really important. And this comes on the back of the reflection. It's really important to have a mission. It's important to have the passion and obsession hmm. and to be able to name it so you know what you're doing. When you get out of bed in the morning, um, for me, I'm really passionate about leading this team. I'm passionate about our business. And I think that that's important for all leaders. Here, we're helping local businesses. We're helping local businesses through a challenging time. We're helping our customers do more. There's more ways that we can help but we are redesigning Groupon. So on um, into a recovery, we can help grow local commerce. And for us, that's energizing. It shows up in multiple ways from our strategy, um, just to the way we, we, we're working throughout the team to develop more empathy and, and more listening um, on the front end with customers and merchants. Um, but I would say you gotta, you gotta start with that passion. But again, I think the ingredient for that is you have to do the reflection so you can really be yeah. genuine and honest with yourself about what your passion is all about. I love it. That's great advice. Uh, well, believe it or not, we are pretty much out of time. So maybe one last question for you um, would just be around any, any last parting words of wisdom you have for people who are listening to this, who are trying to either become better leaders or exceed or grow in their careers. Uh, maybe, the, the greatest leadership lesson uh, that you learned during the course of your career? Um, so I'll go with one that just kind of maybe blends it all together in life is that uh, um, you got to think about your leadership and what you're doing, which the way you used it sounds like it's within work. Um, mm -hmm. But I think you got to think about that in the context of your life and where you show up every which way. Um, and and I think that that perspective is incredibly important um, to um, just, you know, when you look back on life, it was that, do I want to do over? Did I do it right? And, and how am I feeling about everything? I mm. No regrets. So yeah. I, I would just say, um, make sure you have that perspective. Um, I do my best to keep that perspective. Maybe don't get it right all the time. Um, but um, I, think, I think that's important. So that's the best advice I can leave you with. I love it. Well, Aaron, uh, where can people uh, go to learn more about you or Groupon? I mean, anything that you want to mention for people to check out, please feel free to do so. Oh, okay. Well, since you asked, you can learn more about me on, on LinkedIn. That, that'll that only be so interesting. But if you want to learn more about Groupon, let me give you some suggestions. Um, we sell millions of dollars of manicures and pedicures, tens of millions of dollars of massages. Um, and you know, I'm thinking on the recovery of COVID, there's a lot of activity that people are interested in doing. Um, we have great activities with myself, um, everything from archery to golfing, to escape rooms, to VR lounges. I went on this um, um, scavenger hunt with my family outdoors, downtown Chicago, by the bean <laughs> for a couple hours, a couple weeks ago. It was amazing, um, COVID safe. So I recommend that as well. But there's a lot that people can get out and do, even within COVID on Groupon and, of course, um, into the recovery. Um, there's so many other ways to take advantage of the platform. So go to Groupon. Hey, I've, I've purchased many, many things from Groupon. So I'm uh, uh, one, one of your customers on there, and I'm sure a lot of people 
listening and watching this have used Groupon as well. Uh, so Aaron, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to share your insights with me and with the listeners. I really appreciate it. Jacob, thanks a ton. And thanks everyone for tuning in. My guest again has been Aaron Cooper. He is the CEO of Groupon and I will see all of you very soon. Thanks for watching.